Here's gonna be the most incredible part of this float villa. This is the bedroom. And they told me that there are windows inside and we are technically, technically now under the ground, or oh, actually under the hoop, below the water. So let's see what's it look like. Look, it's gonna be really there, some, some windows. Let's open this. Wow, oh my God. Oh my God, guys, I don't know how about you, but I never saw anything like that. This is incredible. This, look, this is real window to the sea, oh my god! Hi there pals, it's so awesome. People, today I'm going to show you about how people live in a country which has almost as much oil as Russia does. Emiratis can get villa for free when they get married. Really, from the government, that's all you need, just to be Emirati and get married. They consider every case differently, so for example, they speak to the person, they found out what kind of situation he has, and, they, and after that, they decide what's gonna do. If you are not capable of, of affording a house, they will uh, uh, assign a home, or build it for you in a designated area. It took the Emirates 50 years to accomplish what took European countries centuries. They turned from a fishing village into a New York-like megalopolis. Apart from their famous skyscrapers, cool new districts constantly appear. This is Dubai's most elite property, but technically speaking, it's a movable property. This floating villa has three floors. It also has this jacuzzi, which is warmed by the wonderful sun of the Emirates. You look at this and think, was it really possible to do it that way? It's just incredible, guys. Within the last 30 years, all the biggest brands open their branches in the UAE. They are constantly increasing their investments as specialists from all over the world come here and Dubai's purchasing power never stops increasing. In this video, you'll see me meeting a family of native Emiratis who work in the UAE government. The main question for me is what Dubai and UAE's secret is. Why does the international business invest so heavily in this place? What is it like when all the laws work? It's unusual in the beginning. You'll meet those very IT specialists, photographers, businessmen who create this beauty of Dubai. I rented this car from a guy who came here to Dubai 11 years ago. He had almost empty pockets when he came here, just like many did. Have you bribed even once here? Never, no one. Ordinary guys come here from Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan and other countries. They're just like we are. Making a career in a country with strict rules is hard, competition-wise. But at the same time, you don't need any friends in the government or connections. You can build your future based on your talent and hard work. It's very hard to break through here. But it seems you have more chances here than anywhere else. It seems, it seems like exactly you can be the one. This is Liadov, and today I'm in Dubai. It's in the UAE. Some 50 years ago, the country almost looked like a desert. There were no skyscrapers, it was just a fishing village here. Yes, they found oil here, but just finding oil is not enough. Take other countries that have much oil and compare them to the UAE. This country managed to become one of the best, quality of life wise. This video is about how you could use your oil, attract investors from all over the world, and make yourself and your people rich. 
This is Liado, and this is how people live in the United Arab Emirates. Dubai, noon, the very centre. I've been trying to get into the tallest building, the Burj Khalifa, using the non-touristic entrance for a week. This is an ordinary residential building, if you don't know, like an apartment building, but a bit taller. The problem is, if you don't live in the Burj Khalifa, it's almost impossible to get into the residential area. If you want to visit your friend of yours, you call him and tell your passport uh, details. So. Uh, he, the, your friend, should call the reception and so on, and then he sends. Uh, he, they will provide a special code for you, and uh, you need to send this code to your friend. And at the entrance, the person will ask you for your for this code, and only after that they will accept you. Three years after my previous visit, the Burj Khalifa is no longer an elite real estate. Middle class have settled here now. You rent a two-bed apartment here for about two thousand dollars per month but the showing off is worth $5,000 or even $10,000. This is what the entrance lobby looks like. Just the entrance lobby, damn. Look at these installations, some, gosh, some cool things. This is a symbol. The whole composition is made of them, a symbol tree. It smells so great in here. It seems like you've entered a mall, a luxury boutique or a beauty salon. It smells great. It looks like a luxurious hotel. Look, plaster is supposed to fall down on you. This is an entrance lobby, guys. To realize how tall the Burj Khalifa is, remember the Eiffel Tower. You can stack three of those near the Burj Khalifa. The tallest building in Moscow, the Federation Tower, has 95 floors. The Burj Khalifa has 165. Did you hear it? 165? It makes 33 stacked five-storey Soviet residential buildings. I look at this building and I cannot believe this is possible to live here. Can you imagine 160 floors? There are around 60 lifts here. 60 lifts, can you imagine? And what's more, if you live, for example, if you stay on the floor number 160, you cannot reach your floor with one lift. No, you need to uh, take one lift, then make, uh, find another transfer, so take another lift, unbelievable. Once I was selling an apartment on one of the top floors, you have no view there. It has a view of Iran, Saudi Arabia, that's the view you get. You can't say that you have a view of fountains, people are tiny from there. It's like a, from a plane almost. It's a height, it's almost a kilometer. It's insane. I managed to get inside only thanks to Michael, a Russian speaking real estate agent. He's been living in Dubai for 11 years. I asked him about his life while in the car. There are many Europeans here. Many British people are moving here now. There are many Russians and Russian speaking people here too. People don't live long in one place here. Here people change places every two years. You've got promoted, you rent an apartment here, or in some other place. People are always trying to improve their dwelling. Before entering the Burj Khalifa, I'm gonna tell you about living here in general. It's expensive here. An apartment with one bedroom and a living room, they call it a one plus one, costs 2,000 to $2,500. At least if you wanna live in a skyscraper. But if you sign a contract for a year, the price almost drops by half. You can find a place for 1,400. It's not going to be in the Burj Khalifa, but in a decent skyscraper too. The main thrill of Dubai is that you rent not just an apartment, but a lifestyle. The price includes pool access. There's a pool outside, there's a pool inside. You can choose it based on the season. This is my old friend Sanjar. He moved to Dubai from Almaty with his wife. At the beginning, he worked for a company, then he became self-employed. 
He's changed a bunch of apartments within the four years. From a one-room apartment with roaches to a cool apartment. In one of the most recognisable buildings in Dubai, the Princess Tower. The building also has a billiard room, a ping pong room, and other games like foosball, board hockey and ping pong. So every apartment you rent gives you a pool access. Well, more likely it is so. It depends on the district. The rent includes it. Yes, you don't pay any extra for this. Food delivery service from the nearest store appeared here more than 10 years ago. There are sunbathing zones, several playing rooms for kids, a gym, which is a common thing here. It has a ping pong room, inside pool with tubs to relax after work, pure pleasure. It has top level security. CCTV cameras are everywhere. Entrance, exit, parking entrance, parking exit, apartment entrance. The Burj Khalifa, which I want to get inside, has a whole security service. In some areas, you can film only using your phone. Filming in some areas is fully forbidden. You can't just get inside, right? Right, you can't even go there by car. See, this is its car entrance. You can't park your car anywhere here, as it'll be towed immediately. They send code to your phone. I'll show you while you're entering. You show the code on your phone and you enter. The same thing with your guests. If someone wants to surprise you, they won't be allowed in, unless you get a code. Here's the car barrier. The Burj Khalifa looks like a tropical flower from above. You can only see it while flying on a plane right above its spire. It looks stunning on the ground too. Inside the tower is like a luxurious hotel. Walls, carpets, everything is shining. Remember me telling you about an unusual for an entrance lobby smell? It turns out they add special oils to the ventilation system. This is an Armani aroma designed specifically for the Burj Khalifa. We're in the first elevator now. Look, it has only two buttons. You can only go to the 76th floor. Your ears get popped immediately. It feels like I'm taking off on a plane. It feels just the same. I can feel we're going really fast. Oh gosh, we've arrived, it's horrible. The building has the world's fastest elevators. They go 18 meters per second. We've got out on one elevator and we're getting inside another one. And you can see we need to walk quite a distance. They're not close at all. Well, we're going. Everything looks great here. You can tell the Arabian luxury. This one won't get you to the top either. Floors 76 to 108. 35,000 people can be in the Burj Khalifa at the same time. That's the size of a small town. In case of incident, there's nowhere to run. So there's a shelter every 30 floors. There's nine of them in total. Three level parking zone for 3,000 cars is underground. First 40 floors are offices and maintenance rooms, then go apartments. Floors 43 and 76 have gyms, pool and jacuzzi tubs. Floor 124 has a viewing platform. In case of fire, they always have something like this, but it's located from the other side. A room which has bottles of water, cans. If a fire breaks out, you go there instead of going down for the 100th floor. The room has a separate oxygen supply. You can easily survive for a week there until the rescuers find you. It has the view of the fountain, Dubai Mall, Sheikh Zayed Road, the Gulf. You can practically see Iraq if you have binoculars. So, the prices vary. They have studios, one bedroom, two bedroom apartments. An average two bedroom apartment costs a million dollars. What's the cheapest one? 400,000, a studio. No fancy rooms, no wine cellars, no underground ice hockey ring. It's a simple, modest apartment. You can't open the window. It's a closed loop air conditioning system. Do they have balconies? They do, but they're for the pools. Terrace-like ones, they're not for the apartments. The TV set is not, hang is not hung on the wall, as you need to get permission for it. But it's very complicated. Permission for what? To hang the TV set. A permission to hang the TV set? Yes, because you need to drill the wall. Yes, you need to get permission to change the floor as well. It's called No Objection Certificate. You can change the floor if you get it. The owner didn't get one for the TV set. 
a small kitchen and hall, plastic sleepers. Gosh, this is the Burj Khalifa. But the entourage is quite modest in general. This is an ordinary apartment. There are no golden toilets here. Maybe some people do have them here, but in general, in general, Dubai is a super modern city with a very high standard of living and good salaries. For example, a simple delivery man gets about $1,500 to $2,000 per month. Waiters and salesmen make about $3,000. A school teacher makes about $4,000. IT specialists make $5,000 and higher. A lawyer's average income is $7,000 and this is not a limit at all. That's why people from all over the world come here. During the period of 2005 to 2020, the country's population increased from 4 million people to 10 million. Today, 88% of the whole UAE's population are immigrants. Only 11% are natives. Only one out of 10 people are a native. Nine of them are immigrants. where local Emirates live, which is very different from what tourists see, because look at this. Here are no skyscrapers, no big buildings at all. They're almost only little villas. If you're born having UAE's passport, you can visit almost all countries without visas and get education and a great healthcare for free. If the local treatment doesn't help or suit you, they'll send you to any necessary clinic in the world. They'll pay for all expenses, including the flight, accommodation and food, for you and for a family member with you. And Emiratis can get villa for free when they get married. Really, from the government, that's all you need, just to be Emirati and get married. They consider every case differently, so for example, they speak to the person, they found out what kind of situation he has and, they, and after that they decide what he's gonna do. So, for example, they can give him land, they can give him villa, they can give him uh, anything else, they can give him just some cash, up to everyone. Something really great. It was extremely hard to get restricted access to the district lived in by the locals. A family of native Emiratis invited me over. This man wearing national clothes is Sultan Karam. So this is like a typical villa, or can you tell us about this? Yeah, it's, a, it's kind of typical villas for Emiratis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, you can see it bigger and smaller than that, but this is the typical villas for Emiratis. Uh, this is my father's villa. Your father, your, your father. Mine is another. He's a typical local. Him, his brother, and his father live on the same street. Just think about it. Each has his own villa, like this one. Not one for the family. Each has one. Just look at the yard. Getting married here is like really expensive. Like it's costing a lot. Like minimum, let's say 300,000 for minimum. Wow, 300,000? Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. So the government also helping with that, uh, with the money, with the place to make the wedding. The, and there is also other things here and there, like in, mm -hmm. they're helping us. Okay. Uh, as, I, as you know, UAE is a country of rules. And we are not only advanced on rules, we have our our systems, when it comes to economic or social or legal systems, are integrated together. So you cannot be a millionaire without me knowing that you are a millionaire. That's never happening in UAE. So if you are really in, in a need for a house and you have a family of two or three and you have a small salary, you don't have a higher education, you have a small job and you require a house. You get a $1,000 allowance for every child per month. They don't pay for utilities at all. The government gives money for renovation and to buy furniture. Just apply for it. This is how it looks from the inside. This is your house? Yeah, it's our house. It's, it's our your... Uh, sorry? It's our madras. Ah, it's your madras. Yeah. Ah. So where we uh, have guests when we uh -huh. have guests. Here we receive the... Look at this smiling man. He's enjoying his tea under a mango tree in his yard. I look at him and realize these golden ages are worth reaching. He has 10 children, three daughters and seven sons. You've seen two of them already. Three of them are officials. But if we look at the 
UAE as a government structure. What do you think is the most important? I mean, like, no corruption, what else? Our judgment systems is very unbiased. Everyone is equal, regardless of their status. We have no corruption at all. In the judgment system especially, no corruption at all. When you have rules and laws, everyone obeys. Rules are important. Remember these words, we'll get back to them later. The head of the family remembers Dubai without a single skyscraper, with only desert all around. It's true, they didn't even have electricity here 70 years ago. Many who don't appreciate this fact say Dubai got lucky to find oil. And everyone got rich this way. But in reality, it wasn't like this at all. The city had begun developing 10 years before the oil was found. The 19th century, the Arab Emirates is alive with tribes. Dubai is a fishing village at the moment. The country doesn't really have food, water or resources. The pirates pillage, the tribes fight, the sheikhs luxuriate. Suddenly a sheikh decides to separate, House of Maktoum. They still rule Dubai, by the way. So they leave Abu Dhabi, settle down in Dubai and announce it an independent city. Then the sheikh suggests making the port of Dubai free of taxes. Businessmen from other emirates and even other countries are savvy to this fact and move to Dubai as they can earn more there. So the local powers begin giving lands to big merchants, like come and work here. They don't just put benefits into their pockets, but they build infrastructure. They get electricity, first connective lines, first hotels. They build an airport in the salt desert. Only six years later, they find oil there. A barrel cost pennies back then, but the city was already growing. There are many countries in the world which has a lot of oil. Mm -hmm. yeah? By the way, Venezuela. Uh -huh. yeah? exactly. But the result of this oil is very different. Mm -hmm. How do you think why? So, they took the right decisions at that time by, uh -huh. by making those, this oil, uh, the oil money, invested back in the country. And you would find it's uh, on the past 50 years, things really uh, started to grow from the 1970s up to the nine, up to 2000. Things was really go the, the the country was growing. People started having a better uh, life in life conditions. Many things have changed since the 1970s. The country was developing. The standard of living improved. Since 1970, Dubai's economy has increased by 231 times. The key to it is not the oil itself, but the way they dealt with it. Almost immediately, the government began investing oil money not to be dependent on oil price in the future. They developed elite class tourism, construction, financial institutions. As a result, the UAE's dependence on oil fell to 20% in 2017. And now, it keeps on the level of about 30%. So we have a huge global trade happening huge manufacturing happening. In this city only, in this city we have around 1,000 manufacturers and 1,000 factories here in Najman. Mm -hmm. And Najman is considered the smallest city in UAE. Here's what really made Dubai, Dubai. They studied the experience of the biggest financial centers of the world, such as New York, London, Zurich, and Singapore. They offered international companies to open their tax-free branches here. They began calling Dubai an economic haven. They had neither income tax nor capital gains tax. This attracted investors from all over the world. Many companies moved their head offices to Dubai, along with the investment. The world's best minds started to arrive in Dubai. Dubai had become the new American dream. I lived rough for a week because I just had no money. How did you find yourself in such a situation? This is SM. She's from Almaty, Kazakhstan. She worked as a shoe seller for some time. When she turned 21, she decided to pursue the Dubai dream. She had no friends or parents around. She was alone. I came here to find a job alone. Offhand, I had no plan or preparations. It was before Ramadan. I came to find a job and I knew nothing at all. The money I'd taken with me was gone. Or is it the age when you don't worry that you're short of money? You don't have any money management. 
So the money was gone and it was a surprise for me. Actually, SM had preparations. In Kazakhstan, she learned to be a translator from Persian and Arabic. Arabic is the official language in the UAE, but something went wrong. It's very hard to be a girl translator from these languages. You can't be one on one. You can't touch a girl. One day, she found herself homeless. She had to sleep near a pool. She had no place to go. Before going back to her story, I'll take a moment to explain. To explain why her translator career failed. Strict laws that differ from European ones are a very important feature of Dubai, especially when it concerns women. They have special seats in the front part of buses. You can't sit next to them if you're not their man. Speaking with a strange local woman on the street is an insult. If you want to address or say something to a woman, you have to talk to a man with her. The Arab world has a taboo around addressing unknown Arab women on the street for a long time. It may seem weird to us, but you can't just come to a woman in hijab and ask her for her phone number. The situation becomes milder every year, but it's not gone yet. The locals have a very peculiar way of meeting girls. The locals have a peculiar way of meeting girls. A local takes his phone, he writes down his name and number in the notes, and puts the phone in front of a girl in a cafe. She writes back without saying a word, and gives him back the phone. I believe a younger generation might, might do that. I see people meeting people back in work or in an entertainment area. They can meet, they can talk to each other, as long as there is a respect between any uh, like a normal respect. It's, uh, it's the normal scenario that's happening worldwide. People are meeting people all the time, everywhere. So we are not a, uh, uh, a special case here, how we meet each other. In Europe, they also often use an application. Uh, Tinder and so on. Do you also use it? People, there are people are using Tinder, people are using social media to meet others, people are going to, uh, I would say, some cultural uh, gathering, people are sometimes going to, and still the traditional way of getting married is still there as well. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the mindset of the mm -hmm. family or the person himself, how he's planning his life or how he's planning to meet the, his people. Shorts, short skirts, décolletage are common in Dubai and the promenade area. But make a 30 minute trip to Sharjah and you'll see a completely different world. Women can't wear skirts, shorts or even pants. Tourists should be careful too. In 2005, a British couple was in prison for a month for kissing in a restaurant. Englishman Jamie Harron tripped in a bar and accidentally touched a man's hip. He was punished for harassment. He spent three months in prison and spent more than $50,000 on lawyers. Based on my experience and on my friends' experiences, I can tell you, uh, you become more law obedient over the years. Do you remember my pal Sanjar? Once, him and his wife Alina were in a traffic jam. Alina, she put her feet, we weren't moving, she just put her feet on the dashboard. A policeman or a security officer came to us. She just put them to rest. She didn't wear a short dress. She just took her shoes off, put her feet on the dashboard. We weren't going. The traffic jam was horrible. We couldn't leave it. He knocked on the window and did this, did this with his finger. He addressed to me, not to her. He came straight to me and told me to tell her not to do this. To make you better understand how it works, every time Sanjar enters the underground, he checks if the bottle cap is tight. You can't drink water in the underground. You can't sleep or even close your eyes. No pets either. If you violate something, they can check cameras. They even have special people special people who go around checking if you paid the fare or if you're sleeping. They can wake you up. I've definitely become more law obedient. You can always try to control yourself in your mind. You watch your mouth. Sanjar came to Dubai about the time SM did, the very girl from Almaty who learnt Arabic in advance. Remember she failed? Well, she came back to Kazakhstan. Then she went to Moscow, learnt how to be a photographer, and came back to Dubai again sometime later. Dubai turned out to be as cruel as Moscow. I had about a thousand and five hundred dollars with me. I had enough money to pay only for two months of rent. So I paid for those two months. I was looking for a job in an ordinal way. I'd send messages to all bloggers on Instagram. 
offering collaborations. I'd send messages to everyone. I'd send them private messages. I had some hope and confidence that I'd find a job within two months. Two months of paid rent were over, but she didn't have any more money. She barely had an order. Imagine yourself in her shoes. You're in a foreign country, you have no job, no relatives near you. You can't even pay a fare. What are you going to do? When I was told I had to move out, as I hadn't paid for the following month, I packed my stuff. I went upstairs to the roof. We had a pool there with the locker room. The locker room had a shower and it was warm here. At the first night, I put all my stuff in the locker room. I slept on a sun lounger. So as not to give herself away, she'd wake up before dawn and secretly go outside. She'd wait for the nearest mall to open and she used the food court to charge her phone and get Wi-Fi so as still to be in touch. I spent about two dollars on food per day. I knew a place where they sold burgers for a dollar, I believe. I bought water for a few cents. I knew these places. I knew the city well enough to walk around. It was very hot. It was a tough time. The scariest thing was to run out of water and food money. My personal advice is to always have a stash of cash for water in Dubai. Always. Imagine having a degree. SM is sitting on the roof by a pool, listening to the steps. Is it a security guard coming for her? She was saved by his not being brave enough to enter the woman's locker room, and his kind heart too. I was sitting next to the pool, thinking it was just... just... like in the movies. I was hitting the rock bottom. And I hit it hard. The only way out of it was up. It's very hard to break through here, but it seems to have more chances here than anywhere else. It seems, it seems like exactly you can be the one. Even if you live rough, even if you have your last two dollars, you still have hope that you, exactly you, can break through. I had this hope from the start. Luxurious cars racing along sand dunes on perfect roads is a symbol of Dubai now. Many people fear that as they have no Lamborghini, they have nothing to do with the Emirates. In fact, these cars have nothing to do with the real life of the Emiratis. Why? Because I rented this car from a guy who came to Dubai 11 years ago. As with many, he had almost empty pockets. He had little money. By the way, he came from Dagestan. He's managed to create a car fleet of dozens of cars. It's worth respect. How does it work with the government bodies, for example? Is it hard to work with them? It's not hard at all. Nothing is hard here. If you follow the rules, if you do as necessary, you won't come across any difficulties. I wouldn't call them difficulties at least. So it's not like you need to have connections, some friend in a department. I've lived here for 11 years. I have no connections or fancy friends. Three years ago, when I was shooting here about supercars, Rajab had only begun developing his business. He had 10 cars back then. He's doubled his car fleet. Plus, he mostly has luxurious cars. I was very persistent. I was working day and night on marketing and stuff to operate successfully. Are these cars uh, fully comp? 
Yes, they are. Everything is going well. I'm keeping up with my business plan. I own a restaurant, a car rent. Recently, I've started a marketing company based on neuromarketing studies. Did you have startup capital when you came here? No, I didn't. How much did you have when you came? I had nothing. At this moment, I remember the words of every head of the Emirati family about rules and justice. Our judgment system is very unbiased. Everyone is equal, regardless of their status. We don't have corruption here, especially in the judgment system. We don't have any corruption at all. It's a bliss when you have rules and laws everyone obeys. Rules are important. Imagine yourself being in the shoes of a big business owner. For example, you're developing a flight company your grandpa started. You've been saving money buying new planes, opening branches in new countries. Then, out of the blue, a country nationalizes your planes. Will you open a branch in this country again? Whenever you see the people stopping on the red light and obeying the laws on the red light, this is a country you can invest in. Otherwise, if you went to a country where people are not stopping to the red lines or not uh, obeying the traffic rules or, the, uh, or the, any kind of rules, it, it's a country that doesn't worth investing in it. So investments and business overall will only grow if there were a, if there were a very obvious and very clear rules and everyone is following those rules. No one is expect, uh, expecting uh, They teach you respect the law and the rights of others from childhood. This is what the social policy and the education system is based on. My, my generation coming after me, it's, and every, every generation is coming is, is following the lead of their parents. So whatever the parents is thinking about the country, it it's will automatically grow in the, on the child or the, or the next generation. Like you, you would normally do, like you just like, oh, wake up, oh my god, this is gonna be a hard day. Well, then you just, oh, I don't wanna wake up, oh, wow, it's gonna be a tough day. Then you wake up and you go to, the, to this window and look at this, ah, oh, guys, Burj Khalifa, so life is not that bad, no, it's not that shitty, great, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, seriously, I think just that, that view makes you encouraging, really. It's gonna make your day a little bit better, yeah. Let's be honest, guys. I'm just touching the window and I feel vibration, seriously. And this is normal. I read that, uh, for example, the tallest buildings, that they can lean 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters, sometimes half a meter, and it's okay. But it's something really, really, I don't know, very hard to understand because I feel like, I feel the wind, and there's a very high wind there. The taller the building, the more it sways. The Burj Khalifa can bend up to 1.5 meters from its axis, and it remains safe and sound. Here's a curious room, which I never saw in different countries. So for example, you live in Burj Khalifa, and you have some friend which is about to come to your house, but you don't really like him, or oh, you don't want to, meet him in your apartment. I don't know, it's a mess in your room. So, but you need to see this guy. There's a special room here in Burj Khalifa for uh, taking guests, which is very comfortable. Look, there's a really great sofas. There's also infrastructure for making coffee, which is free and so on, so on. And there's also a beautiful view on Dubai. This is the most astonishing thing I saw. Can you see the pool over there? It's absolutely not like the one SM slept near. Slept near. The pool was small and modest according to Dubai standards. Each morning she'd wake up before dawn, go outside and wait for the mall to open so she could get Wi-Fi access. Once she began charging her phone and got an Instagram direct message. I got a message from a Belarus blogger. I had shot her, we still had a place to live. She said she needed a private photographer. Then it was like a Hollywood movie. That blogger was from the fashion industry. 
First, there were private photo shoots, then it began. International brands, one followed another. Jimmy Choo, Michael Kors, Prada. Jimmy Choo says we're launching a new collection in the Middle East. We want you not to advertise, but to show how to match these shoes with different clothes. And she organized, she organized bachelorette parties. People would come, she'd show how to match things. I'd take shots, sometimes film it. She got paid $5,500 for posting stories for the whole day with Jimmy Choo hashtag. And she created an Instagram post for $1,500. It was very cool at that moment. As they say in motivational posts, your life is in your hands, so don't give up. SM was hammering away day and night, no days off. I was like a monkey with a camera. I got a bit tired. I'd save some money by that moment. I decided to start working on my own. It was difficult. No one knows you. You've never worked with this. I mean, new photos, swimwear, underwear. I love taking these photos. And it was hard at the very beginning, but then, like a rumor mill, my work that I had shot here in Dubai was published in Cosmopolitan. It was a moment of fame for me. I had goosebumps while talking to her. She's so determined. I felt like I was watching a Hollywood movie. I got into a Russian girl's crew. She was a photographer and she needed a videographer. We got lucky, we... We shot the wedding of a girl, whose last name was Maktoum. She belonged to the famous house of Maktoum. She belonged to the famous house of Maktoum. Everyone knows this name in Dubai. Remember me telling you about a sheikh who separated and founded a new city? He was Sheikh Maktoum. Today, Sheikh Maktoum's portraits are in each building in Dubai, including the house of our Emirati friends. Here he is. He's the country's vice president and PM the head of Dubai, Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum. His late father was one of the founders of the Emirates. The House of Maktoum have been ruling Dubai ever since. They say the city owes its modern look to Mohammed Al Maktoum, the Burj Khalifa, the seaport, the Palm Islands, Emirates Flying Company. This is not the full list of his projects. Once a year, his scientific fund awards a million dollars for a significant contribution to spreading knowledge. Among the winners are the inventor of the internet, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, a creator of Wikipedia, Jimmy Wales, and Microsoft founder, Bill Gates. In Dubai, they named the 400 meter long bridge, a district of elite real estate, the airport that holds the world record on the number of passengers and flights after the House of Maktoum, even the space center. Yes, you heard that right. The Arabs have sent a shuttle to Mars that outraced the USA and China in terms of speed. For the space center, they created a tower and the biggest solar panel fleet around it. Now that you're familiar with the House of Maktoum, you can realize how good you must be to shoot their family celebration. Boys and girls celebrate separately. The groom comes to take the bride away at the very last moment. This is the only moment when a man joins their party. And he takes the bride away. When the Arab girls and women celebrate, they take off their black niqabs, their black clothes, and the party gets started. What do they do? First of all, all women are incredibly exotic. Being a girl, I admired them. So the groom celebrated somewhere else? He did. I don't know where the men celebrated. I don't even think they were somewhere near. Because there weren't any people gathering around, he just came along with several cars to take the bride away. When the groom entered, you know, everyone covered themselves in black. Like in the Matrix. the canals to get to any part of the city without traffic jams. They have all kinds of boats here. Ski jets, 
cutters, yachts. They use these archaic wooden ships to ride tourists about. A whole cafe street is located nearby. And when you enter here, so it looks very cozy. This is a very cozy atmosphere, it looks like, because the buildings here are not that high. There are two floors, maximum three floors, and it may remind you something about Europe. In this case, for example, like Paris. But if you look this way, it's more American style. Look, this. there's a big tower with water. What I like most about this is that all of it the main idea of to make people live happy. This is something I really admire. That all idea so that everything that's being done here in the country is done to make you leave your office at 6 p.m., get together with your family and just walk. You will be just walking and relaxing and speaking to each other, having coffee, dinner and so on and so on. Nothing else. And I really admire this. Really. I know you guys in the Western countries maybe get used to it, but we are not. It's super clean here. No packages or cigarette butts. The cleanliness seems artificial. You can even hear it. Listen to these guys kick, squeak. The biggest problem of Dubai is temperature because June, July and August here is plus 50, plus 55 and it's unstandable really. So people walk uh, around the streets just uh, covering themselves, staying here in the shadow, running a little and so on, yeah. You can go outside at 2 a.m. and you will still be sweating because it's unbearable, really. There was an interesting decision on that, so some years ago they suggested like, let's build a whole quarter which will be air conditioned. I mean like they're gonna build three, three malls which gonna be uh, all together. They wanna build the glass roof and all this, uh, all this room is gonna be air conditioned. What do you think about? Huh? Really guys? You wanna air condition your streets? This restaurant and confectionery in the city centre is one of the fanciest places. A vivid example of a successful business in the Emirates. You'll never guess who owns it. A family from Tom's, a small city in Siberia. Is this quite an expensive location? It's quite expensive, yes. It's located near the downtown and the Burj Khalifa. We also have a location in the Dubai Mall. There are two top locations in the Emirates. How much does the rent cost on this location? It's about $500,000 per year. The Lito Cafe is not only for tourists. The Emiratis like coming here with their families. They munch out on coffees and desserts. They can eat desserts until late in the night. Really? Yes, up to midnight or 1am, because they don't drink alcohol here. That's kind of how they compensate, I guess. So they eat desserts instead of alcohol? Right. The sweet industry is well developed here, so cafes that serve desserts are doing well. They look great indeed. Our chain appeared in London in 2011. At the moment we arrive, at the moment we have our cafes in the UK and in all Arab countries. I'll enumerate the Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, and Jordan. You created it alone? Yes. Yeah. Really? It took me 10 years. How old are you? I'm 30. 30? Yes, you're younger than me, gosh. Really? Not exactly alone. It could be wrong to say so. I'm going to lose the rest of my hair now. My crew and I are working very hard. They help me a lot. When Artem was 16, his parents decided to move to London from Siberia. There they opened a small cafe and confectionery. That became very popular through time thanks to a windowsill. The room had a very long window, but it wasn't really very spacious, so we turned the window into a cake showcase. All passers-by would see would be like cool cakes and come inside after it. Once they got inside, they realized we also served food, coffee and so on. Does this trick still work? It does. It's our feature now. We started to improve in England. We opened two more cafes. Our fourth location, by chance, was opposite the Jumarai Hotel. 
It was in 2012 or 2013. The Arabs traveled a lot to the UK back then. A cake that they liked very much is based on Russian condensed milk. They tried it and a princess amongst them posted a picture of it. It became very popular. It was like a rumor mill. Now we had sheikhs from the Emirates and Qatar as our guests. They say the sheikhs of Dubai visited us. Then they began using their private jets to ship our cakes from London. They take cakes from our cafes, load them on board and ship them off to Dubai. Then they offered a partnership here. They offered to start a franchise, to do this or that. They opened their first cafe in Dubai in 2016. On the first day, they had so many guests that they could barely manage the orders. Then someone else came. We got a call from the local mall's management. They said, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid wanted to come, the Prime Minister. I was like, are you serious? They said, yes, he knows you from London. His chief of security wants to know if they can come on the first day. We're just working and then suddenly see the Sheikh. And eight men enter with him. Everybody just freezes as he walks by. Both the waiters and the guests, everybody is shocked to see the shape. Chuck it to a to the other side. It's all I just know it down around. Dubai never stops growing and improving. They develop both land and the ocean. They were the first to build artificial islands and place houses there, right in the middle of the Persian Gulf. Well, we're headed to the most expensive and elite real estate in Dubai. This is just the top level. The most expensive real estate of Dubai is not located in Dubai exactly, but on the seafront of it. The only way to get there is by water. If you don't have your own yacht or boat, you can take a water taxi, but it's very expensive. So I mean like here in Dubai, there is now even water taxi. So, but it is pretty extensive. So taxi from, from the mainland to one of the islands costs $20 one way, so it is $40 two ways, which is extremely expensive. And here in Dubai they say like, come on guys, it's too expensive for us to take taxi, let's buy the, the yacht. This is Dubai, <laughs> this is the way they think. Now they've finished a huge group of islands which represent the world. One island represents a country, and so on. So they've built a whole state in the middle of the sea. They have Lebanon Island, for example. This is an island of entertainment only. There is a Lebanon Island, which is just created for fun. Only for fun, yeah. There are no buildings, there are no offices, there is nothing. Only uh, something that, some places where you can just lay down, relax, take your pina colada, and just feel that you're a king of, the, of this life. something incredible. I've never seen so many trees in Dubai. They have a whole jungle here. Each of these trees and bushes was taken from all over the world. This jungle is totally man-made too. The vegetation was brought here and planted. As you can see, it looks just great. So all these trees were brought here. They didn't just grow here. We only had sand here. Even these bushes didn't grow here. And the grass. Everything. So everything was planted here. Amazing. How do you do that? They transplant it, transport it, plant it, watch it and water it. They take good care of it. Where are all these things from? Europe. All over the world. Really? Yeah. Wow, so cool. Do any living creatures appear here? Birds. Yes, there are many birds here. Was it the customer's desire to design the island this way or, or what? Yes, as they don't have very much vegetation in Dubai. They don't have it at all. Right. We mostly have sea and sand. So they wanted to make it as green as possible. Is this villa sold or for sale? It's for sale. Let's go see it. This is the villa. It has as many pools as you want, both for adults and kids, and a beach within walking distance. This is your own private beach. This is an infinity pool. What does it mean? Well, it's the one that goes all the way to the horizon, right? So you can see the end of it. So you have your own pool, your own sea, your own ocean too, right? Damn, it's a real beach. There are several ways to get there. 
Right, this is a more wild one, see? This is like an industrial way. It's more wild one. Depending on your mood this day. Depending on your mood, they may even make bent palm trees on purpose. Can you see this one with a prop? They lean the trunk, attach it to a special iron thing, and it grows bent. You get a perfect bounty commercial scenery. You have it almost on each island now. This is so cool. It's like a flying ship. Right, it has the shape of a ship. Really, yeah. This is just top notch. Stunning. This is like a mall, we can say, right? Yeah, right. The house is the size of a mall, indeed. Now we're inside the villa. A super luxurious one. Right, it's premium class. It has seven bedrooms, six floors. Six floors? Yeah, taller than old Soviet apartment buildings. You know what, guys? They have their own lift. Yeah. What's it like to live in a house with six floors? Six floors, guys. It's something really, if I lived in a house with the six floors, I would definitely ask for a lift. It, there's no way for me to come up to eat six floors. No, it's too much, guys, for me. No, really. Without lift, I wouldn't, wouldn't take food every day. Seriously. Look, this is the lift. It's just arrived. So here are six floors. And what's more? Oh, <laughs> what I'm speaking about that here's a a button where you can ring if you get stuck in your lift and there is a person who is sitting there for 24 hours can you imagine and waiting for you to get stuck in the lift your own beach your own pool everything your city your citizens i'll be damned you can create your own nationality here it's like a palace it's a palace indeed 400 square kilometers it has a restaurant like kitchen Hired cooks do the cooking, it's obvious. There's also the whole staff for maintenance, as this is a really big house. We're in one of the bedrooms now. You wake up and see this panoramic view of the ocean. Very beautiful. The room itself is huge. There's a bathtub in this very room. There we have dressing room and jacuzzi. There are six of these bedrooms here. Each bedroom has a bathtub, toilet and dressing room. Not just a closet, but a whole room with wardrobes. That's how rich people in the Emirates live. Look at this enormous bedroom. Gosh, the bathtub is top notch. I believe it's made of granite. You get inside this place, breathe in the smell of this place. You feel like a shake. The smell gives you this feeling. I mean it. This is the dining room and the living room. The dwelling of dreams. The magnificence makes your head spin. Just look at this table. Check out these leather covered chairs with Bentley logo. All furniture here is by Bentley. Hey, coming down like precipitation. I ain't never met a limitation. Hate applying my elimination. Gotta go to Google for the information. I'm a superstar, so I gotta shine. Top dollar be the bottom line. Bottom feeding. I thought the villas of the Emiratis we were in at the beginning were luxurious. But those people were right. Compared to this, that house is modest indeed. The best things are located on the lower floor. Here's the gym. The gym is good enough for a conservatory or the Covent Garden. There are mirrors everywhere. Everything is shiny. Here we have a massage room. Gosh, just look at this. Everything is so delicate. I think you could just lie here and you don't need any massage anymore. You'll be enjoying touching this. It's extremely delicate leather. The best part is here, a sauna. You may think sauna in the house is not a big deal for us. Many of us have bathhouses. Now I'm going to show you the room which you would never think you could find in Dubai. Never. So, first door is the sauna, which is a regular sauna, we all have saunas. But the next, this is the snow room, where you can find the real snow, although outside there is plus 50 degree, plus 53 sometimes even. And here, look, there is a snow falling from the sky not exactly from the sky but from the ceiling yeah here's it it is unbelievable and you take this amount of snow and you feel like here's the winter you can invent the winter whenever you want Unbelievable, look at this, and 
a very unusual device. So the snow is appearing there, and this is there is a, this thing which like a blade, and there are, here are some blades which take this snow from the ceiling and make it fall down. And if you stand here and you think like you are in the Alps of Europe or in Canada. It's a really unbeatable because, guys, don't forget the fact that, that you are on a, uh, on an island which was made by hands of people. Because some years ago, there was nothing. There was only water. It was just the sea and the ocean. Unbelievable. The most stunning thing about this villa is that the veranda is under a dome of glass. Just look at this view. It's absolutely gorgeous wherever you look. There's a reason why I'm in such an unusual and beautiful place. I want to show you this area of Dubai. The whole neighborhood is situated on water. A water neighborhood of Dubai, so to say. The main entertainment is concentrated here. People rent huge yachts to throw all kinds of parties on. Our yacht is 101 feet long. It's about 30 meters. The yacht is very big and spacious. It has five cabins, five bathrooms, and as you can see, a spacious lounge combined with a dining area. The yacht has everything you need for relaxation and even more. No city bustle, only the sea. You can swim as much as you want. There's a separate cabin too. For nine beds. For nine beds? Yes. Such a yacht will cost you around 300,000 US dollars. But don't worry, you can rent it for about $800 per hour. The service is so popular that the boats don't stand idle without guests. On weekdays, there are mostly families, tourist groups. On weekends, people want to relax, mostly. They are mainly Dubai residents. They gather here as they might get tired of bars and restaurants. I think renting a yacht is a great option in Dubai. You can hire a DJ, you can order food and drinks, you can just throw away a party far from people. Ranjis from India is the captain. He's worked for this company for six years. Yes. So you work as a captain, yes. especially on this boat, or is it different boat? Different boat, yeah. Different boat. Can you tell me about uh, yachting in Dubai? What's it like? It's almost amazing uh, for the yacht parties here, for the sightseeing tour, for the customers and clients here. Yeah. Right. Uh, so is it uh, difficult to control the yacht? Yes. Yeah? yeah, difficult to control this one. What is, uh, Normally, when the outside there is a waves, the weather, change different for the parking it's difficult to park back at home he became a skipper here he got an opportunity to improve and became a captain thanks to the job Ranji supports not only his wife and kids but all of his relatives in India is this a well-paid profession like how much yes. is your salary more or less salary salary after all yeah, uh, normal a good salary for me what's it like right? 5,500 80 5,500 Unions are another necessary advantage for workers in Dubai. It's amazing how this world of capitalism has an island of socialism. If you get an official job, the probability of being cheated or unpaid is negligible. In Dubai, the law protects legal work. Any worker can contact in case there is a misunderstanding with the employer and he can file a complaint. After the complaint, this body can send a man to check the situation. They'll inspect the company and they'll work on the complaint. In Dubai, employers have no right to shout at employees. You can't even raise your voice. If you do, you can get a complaint and further inspection. The outcome may be bad for the employer. 
You can now even file a complaint via text message. Any ambiguous word can be interpreted in different ways, but seemingly no one overdoes it here. This is very unusual in the beginning, absolutely. You can't believe you live in a country where you feel absolutely safe. Speaking about it job-wise, it's a very comfortable feeling. That's why I've been working for this company for eight years. I can tell I'm a quite happy person. You see Dubai and realize they did it. They succeeded in making their citizens, their passport holders, their ordinary locals live greatly. So greatly that expats from all over the world just started coming here to even get a little bit of this standard of life. Yes, you can endlessly tell that Dubai has no soul, that everything is so shiny here and so on. You can say so, and it's kind of true. But the thing is, they succeeded in turning desert into a city. People from all over the world dream to live here. It's a safe city, into a city that has absolutely everything. It's comfortable. They have no shame saying that they want to be rich or live in a cool place or have everything. No one is ashamed of thinking about their own benefit. No one is ashamed of their desire to have a lot of money. They tell us not to complain. Shit, you can complain. It's totally okay if you want to live in prosperity. It's perfectly okay to want this. Any sane person must want this. He must want his family, kids, etc. to live in prosperity. I think nothing can make a sane person abandon their desire to make his family live in prosperity. To have money to attend the best classes, schools, to travel. I don't understand how you can live for something else. Who are you going to complain to on your deathbed? Who are you going to show the list of your sufferings to? You're going to say, here I suffered for this man, here I suffered for that organization, here I suffered for something else. Who are you going to complain to when you're on your deathbed? Did you enjoy it? Did you live life to the full? Did you try the best things in the world? Did you see the world? All this is in your hands alone. I don't see a reason to be ashamed of living well. When I see Dubai, I can't help but admire the way that they prioritized the very desire to make their people live in prosperity, to make them wealthier. And this is not just words, this is reality.